Jeszcze jedno, mam tu napisane, że you are in practice session. Nie wiem, co to znaczy. Recording in progress. Dzień dobry. Zacznę od krótkiego ogłoszenia. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let's start with the technicalities. Our Zoom guests can use translation into Polish at the bottom of the screen. Translation on the bottom of your Zoom window. Streaming po polsku jest dostępny na Facebook. Polish streaming available in Facebook, Euroactive Poland and European Commission in Poland. On Euroactive Poland's YouTube channel. A po tym po technicznym, krótkim wstępie... And raz after jeszcze... housekeeping announcement, a very warm welcome reverberated to all of you who've been brought together for Fit for 55 conference. What are the challenges for Poland? My name is Karolina Zbytniewska. I'm the editor-in-chief of Euroactive Poland. And this is the topic that stirs lots of emotion about politicians and others. We have the most important decision makers in Poland and European Union brought with us. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Adam Zibirze Czerfartyński, Under Secretary of State in the Ministry of Climate and Environment. Mr. Rafael Maura Petriccione, starting 2018, Director General at DG Climate. This is uh, European Commission. Grzegorz Tobiszowski, Euro MP, yes, 2015-2019, the Secretary of State in the Ministry of Energy. Ms. Isabella Zygmunt, expert for European Green Deal of uh, the European Commission in Poland, who has collaborated with such organization as Wise Europe, Polish Green Network, or C Bankwatch Network. Last but not least, Professor Zbigniew Karaczon, extraordinary professor of uh, Life Sciences University in Warsaw, SGGW, Environmental Protection and Dendrology uh, Department. Dr. Joanna Maczkowiak was supposed to be with us. She's the president of the Energy Forum. However, owing to some ailments, she has been unable to join the meeting. We are very sorry we wish you return to health um, swiftly. Ladies and gentlemen, let's start with a very short introduction to this conference. The packet of legislative changes fit for 55 is the hero of today's meeting. It was announced by the European Commission on the 14th July last year. Fit for 55 is one of the key elements of the European Green Deal and at the same time a part of the European climate laws. The Fit for 55 packet goal is to reduce greenhouse emissions by at least 55% by the year 2030, compared to 1990s level. By 2050, the European Union struggles to achieve net zero emission. The European climate laws have been supported by all member states of the European Union. However, climate goals delivery requires adaptation of EU legal regulations. The FIT for 55 is composed of 13 legislative proposals, some of them being new, some of them are just amendments to the legislation that already exists. One of the most important aspects and most debated parts of the package is the European Emissions Trading System Reform, in abbreviation ETS, and CBAM, Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, as well as uh, the Energy Performance of Building Directive refurbishment. The European Commission proposals must be approved by EU governments, EU member states governments, as well as European Parliament. That was the word of introduction. And now the floor goes to our panelists. So would you please answer briefly and precisely to the questions? Therefore, we'll be able to to discuss all the problems. So maximum five minutes answers. Otherwise, I will chop in. I do apologize. If your answer is shorter, you have a chance to get another question. So let's start with Minister Czetwertyński. This is the question to you. What is today's official Polish government's stance on Fit for 55 package? 
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know whether I'm able to squeeze my answer into five minutes because we've got 14 proposals. If I am to tell you in details about each of them, it would take a long time. So let me limit myself to some general remarks. There is a basic question. We need to make sure that the solutions that are designed at the European Union level, not only will they make it possible to attain climatic goals, which is very important, but on top of that, these will not create any additional burden for the societies, especially for the disadvantaged, impoverished ones. A series of proposals or elements uh, proposed by the Commission might be improved from the point of view presented a moment ago. European Council informed about the objectives by 2030, and they outlined a set of preconditions, general framework for the whole package for, a, for European Union climate policy. This is important to observe the framework because there are strictly defined conditions which may make it possible to deliver the goals. From the point of view of technological capabilities, when it comes to reduction emissions and the necessary investments. So these agreements must be reflected in the package. One of the key questions for us from this point of view is the question of the existing inequalities in ETS. One of the things is that uh, the ETS sends out the price signal. The polluters, the greatest pollutants, should reduce emissions, should transform, should replace to use zero emission ones uh, in order to limit emissions in total. For this process of transformation to be efficient, ETS system should make it possible to invest. We should switch from the system that is an additional tax for the economy, additional burden to investment system that enhances transformation of our economy. And this is the problem that we are facing not all the resources generated in the system are then directed for transformation of this energy sector, in particular also energy consuming sectors and other related sectors that also need to reduce emissions. Speaking about the questions that generate great burden for economy. Let me mention about just one. In our opinion, this has a high social cost with limited efficiency when it comes to emission reductions. The new ETS system for buildings and transport. Introduction of this additional tax in these sectors will not result in substantial emission reductions, but will bear unwanted consequences on the society. Therefore, we should be looking for some other ways and ideas to attain our goals. It was a general answer to your question. Thank you very much. Director Petriccione. <clears throat> so first, I wanted to ask you to take a step back and ask you briefly to explain the Fit for 55 package from the, its author's uh, standpoint, from the European Commission standpoint, and why European Commission created it in the first place. But at the same time, I cannot not ask you, as in the second uh, part of your uh, intervention, not to address what uh, Mr. Czetwertyński said. But maybe let's start with this short explanation. 
Well, I don't think I need to recall, remind everybody of the damage that climate change can, uh, can do. I think we're beginning to see it on a, on, a, on a daily basis. The culprit is the fact that we are, we've developed our society based on fossil fuels everywhere, whether it's coal, oil, or gas, um, matters, matters, but not, not, too, not too much. We need to change our society in depth. And I want to be clear, this is not something to do instead of everything else. This transformation can only succeed if we decide that we're going to achieve all our objectives, whether it's uh, social equality, whether it's fairness, economic growth, job creation, whatever we want to achieve in a different way that helps stop climate change and doesn't make the problem worse. So this is not an alternative to those objectives. Uh, so competitiveness, modernization of the economy, new technologies, energy security, independence, air quality, they're all part of the same trend. And then we have a transition, 30 years. Um, the, uh, the transition starts now, but doesn't end now. Uh, and this is very difficult for people to understand because we don't have, as humans, a 30 years horizon in our brain. Um, our horizon is next week, next month, next year. Perhaps we can make, make some big commitments for the future, but continuous action for 30 years is not natural for us. And that's why we need to invest now in front-loading. Front-loading investment, front-loading the change, uh, making this process irreversible and organize ourselves uh, over the next 10 years. And that's also what science tells us. What, what do you mean by front-loading? Well, it means that if you want to achieve, if you want to uh, change the technology for in the heavy industry like steel or chemicals, you have to start investing now to see the results towards the end of this decade, because these things don't happen overnight. It takes research, it takes money, it takes time to uh, develop these, especially if you want to do it in a way that's not disruptive. Uh, and that's why uh, this next decade, this 50 or 55 is crucial. It's one step, but perhaps the biggest step towards the, the, the final goal which is net zero emissions in 2050. Now, you asked me to react to um, my very good friend, Adam. At the end of the day, uh, DTS is not a burden for the economy. DTS is a burden for those who don't want to change. Um, and it is an incentive to save money, not to spend. Uh, and the problem is that there are many people who are capable of reacting in a positive way in Poland or everywhere else. And there are some who don't want to, and they should pay the price, or some who can't, and they should be helped. They should be helped by public authorities, whether it's the Polish national government, whether it's the European Union, uh, and there are mechanisms to, to do that. The new system that the other mentioned is because emissions in uh, public in road transport and buildings continue to grow. What we've done for the past 10 years simply has not worked. And like, as you can imagine, I um, happen to disagree with this view that it will not work. Now, the question is, every, not everybody will be able to go. That we know. And that's why we propose to use a big portion of the revenues that the system will uh, generate to help those who cannot help themselves. Uh, we are also proposing all ETS. Could you, could you just uh, specify uh, who do you mean by victims uh, well, of uh, this transformation? I think victims is, is, is the wrong word. I'm sorry, just to give you an example. Most of the emissions come from residential buildings. Uh, most normal people cannot afford a reno house renovation. They could probably pay for it if somebody lent the money at the beginning. But an ordinary person with a good salary does not usually get easily a loan to renovate a house, but they can pay for it. And they can reap the benefits of greater energy efficiency and lower energy bills over time. Do we give them that time perspective? Do we give them help in getting a loan? And then you have a minority of people, but it's a very important minority socially, who can, just cannot pay for energy. They need to be helped. The only way to help them is income support. 
Uh, and we have to do this. The majority of people who own buildings, however, are commercial companies, but public entities. And they can pay for renovation. They can invest in the long term. There are mechanisms which have been used in a number of countries, Slovakia is a very good example, of uh, energy companies paying for the renovation and splitting the uh, savings uh, with the owners of the building. But it's much more difficult to do for individuals, for an individual home than it is for a, for a company building. But it's not rocket science. Uh, we can do these things if we set our mind to it. Thank you very much. Uh, teraz pytanie do pana ministra Tobiszewskiego. The next question goes to Minister Tobiszewski, and I would like to ask you about your assessment about the future for coal in future and what mining regions uh, would expect in the return for supporting uh, the efforts towards uh, climate neutrality in Europe and what should, in your view, a just transition look like? Thank you very much. And in general, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this debate. As regards the future of coal, and when I say coal, I mean hard coal, but also lignite, uh, which is very important, not only in Poland, but also Germany uses a lot of lignite in their energy system, which we tend to forget in Europe. I think that the role of coal is decreasing and that dynamically. Um, only 10 years ago, it was 120,000 people who worked in mining. Now it's 30,000. Uh, and uh, now uh, we have a distinction because between coal mines that uh, produce coking coal, uh, coal, which is coal for power plants. And when we talk about this, coal, we are talking about 40 million tons of uh, output every year. So there is a huge difference between um, the role of coal today and 10 years ago. The same applies uh, to lignite. So this process has already started and it will continue as new technologies are coming in. They are less even uh, conventional power plants uh, are less reliant on coal. Let me just give you an example of Yavozno or Opole power plants, uh, which use new technologies which make it possible uh, to consume less coal and to cut emissions. And I think we really need to accentuate it. Um, the problem we have in Poland is with emissions from, um, uh, from uh, residential buildings. We refer to it as low emissions, I mean, emissions generated in the low altitude, um, because this is uh, the emission that generates smog. I come from Silesia, and I'm happy to hear uh, that in this context, we hear the name of this region, uh, Śląsk, Silesia, a lot. But the, the similar problems refer to Bełchat, of central Poland, to Lublin. And, um, all these regions are facing challenges uh, and all these regions need investment plans. When we talk about Silesia, in many places where we used to have heating plants and mines, we have modern companies, IT companies uh, uh, in the same buildings now. What these regions need right now is more stability. So, so, so over time, uh, with every new government, we have higher ambitions, and the new ambitions tend not to rely on what uh, the previous administration has done, and uh, we tend not to look at uh, what the previous uh, parliament, European parliament, has done, and uh, Rather than following up on what has been done already, we try to introduce new ambitions. And I think the point is to work based on a correct assessment of what has been achieved in terms of cutting energy, um, energy efficiency of the industry. So what you're saying is that we need a strategy. I'm saying that we need to speak in more accurate terms, not in generals, but say we need to do this and say specifically how much money it will cost, etc. And in short term perspective, when you talk about the industry, heavy industry, but also the other sectors that develop around it, for example, um, the metal um, sector. And uh, 
we have this industry and yet uh, we have to import from other countries uh, outside the European Union that are not as ambitious as we are in terms of cutting emissions. Uh, and we have to look at it as well, because if we will be the ones uh, looking at the climate and uh, other regions such as India, Indonesia and China, if they fail to do so, so then we will lose this battle because uh, if we don't see energy transition in these regions as well and instead we will just purchase energy or products from them we will not cut emissions globally we will just shift sources of emissions and this is an additional challenge that europe is facing we have to transform but we cannot lose our competitive edge. And in the commission, I remember a discussion um, when you talked about it. And of course, we support the ideas of Commissioner Brayton for new technologies, for more digitization of industry, so that uh, we can face this challenge. And on top of that, we are dealing with a pandemic and we have to be really humble and realize that this is an additional burden uh, that um, it is very important to, to bear that in mind and not to be over ambitious with our goals because we have to ensure that our economy will be able to transform in stable conditions thank you very much my next question goes to isabella sigmund isabella what are the far-reaching impacts uh, whether positive or negative of the fifth for 55 package and in my second question i would like to ask you um, what challenges in the field of energy Poland will face in that regard. Thank you very much for this question. As regards impacts of uh, the Fit for 55 package for Poland, it will probably not be surprising when I tell you that in order to reach uh, the objectives and the uh, fit for 55, we need to take steps that we would have to take anyway in order to uh, solve other problems. For example, we have to increase uh, the share of renewable energies. We have to reduce energy uh, consumption from buildings. We have to cut emissions from transport. So these are some huge challenges that uh, this package has decided to address. And uh, this steps will make it possible uh, for us in Poland to deal with the problem of air pollution and more specifically smog, which we haven't been able to do before. And under the package, it will be possible to introduce uh, some activities in order to reduce energy uh, poverty. As the director said uh, before, in the package, there will be support programs, for example, for renovation of buildings that will be made made available to people regardless of uh, how much money they make because what we need is just transition this is one of the requirements secondly i mentioned the word transport and in order uh, to meet the objectives of the fifth for 55 we have to develop public transport and we have to and when we do that, we will be able uh, to deal with the problem of transport exclusion, which is a serious uh, transport problem in Poland. Thirdly, dependence of, uh, on energy sources. If we increase the uh, share of renewable energy sources, we will reduce our dependency on fossil fuels, which right now are being imported from other countries for huge amounts of money from countries uh, with which we not always want to cooperate. And it's another point, which is actually a proposal that was present in the previous uh, EU proposal. Um, this is something I refer to as democratization. This is the clean energy for all Europeans package from uh, 2014. It is still valid. And it assumed uh, that the role of the citizens will be strengthened. They will become subjects of this process. Uh, and I think uh, 
these solutions will continue to be relevant uh, uh, under Fit for 55 until 2030. It will make it possible to distribute income from the production of energy in a more democratic way. Your statistic citizen will be able to co-produce energy, will become a subject of this market, and this market will be governed by more transparent rules. Uh, Mr. Tomiszowski, Tomiszowski mentioned the problem of uh, leakage of emissions uh, uh, to other non-European countries. The Fit for 55 package has an answer to this in the form of the CBAM uh, mechanism, the carbon border adjustment mechanism, a kind of border tax, we could say, that is supposed to counteract uh, this problem. And if you ask me about possible negative impacts, I don't see any direct negative impacts of 55 as such, but there is a level of risk uh, that we'll face if we try um, to, to oppose this or develop in the opposite direction. So uh, when we look at the development of prices in Poland right now, it is due to long years of neglect. Compared to other EU member states, Polish energy production relies on coal to a very high extent, and the ETS system is tied to higher energy prices in the current Polish situation if in our energy mix uh, there were more clean sources of energy and renewable energy sources, we would not be dealing with that problem right now. If Poland or any other EU member state decide uh, to pursue its energy policies in the opposite direction than the Fit for 55 suggests, then we might be facing a, a risk and uh, face some problems. So I think this is my answer to your question about possible challenging impacts. So we will have to adapt to the developments in general. At the end, let me remind you that right now we are discussing about the final shape of the reforms we will see adopted and the fifth for 55 proposed by the commission so the proposals that have been made will have to be discussed and probably adjusted to a certain extent now ever. Uh, the stipulations of the Paris Agreement or the European Climate Laws, the fact that by 2030 we have to cut emission by at least 55%, this is not debatable anymore. This is a commitment, this is an obligation um, that we have made as Poland, as the European Union, and we have to remember about that time perspective when we talk about these subjects, because here there is no more space for opening or reopening or revisiting that um, this discussion, this goal has been adopted. This is our commitment. We have to fulfill it now. Thank you very much indeed. And now the floor goes to Professor Karachin. So, Professor, what is your assessment of Fit for 55 package? And in your opinion, what is going to be the impact on Poland's agriculture? And is this sufficient enough so that Polish agriculture undergoes climatic transformation? Thank you very much, and thank you very much for inviting me to speak in this uh, outstanding fellowship of speakers. If you're asking me what is a fit for 55 for Poland, I cannot uh, forget about the words of uh, minister and MP. When I listen to Polish politicians, uh, I have a feeling as if they were presenting uh, the negotiations that started two years ago, not 30 years ago, with Poland's accession to the UNO Framework Convention on Climate Change. They seem to pretend as if for 30 years they had forgotten that we need to act for the benefit of climate. If I hear the problems related to ETS, because ETS does not provide uh, good finances for investment. It is not a good in, in, uh, instrument that fit the transformation purposes in energy. I would ask a question. What happened with 40 billion of Polish resources that Polish state budget received for selling emission rights? You need to remember, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that the money goes to the Polish budget. Uh, people should remember a bit about this. Had we used the 40 billion slotters and earmarked it for green energy investments for agriculture, we would have had all 
farms energy neutral and independent and they would not be the subject of this negative impact of energy prices that would be devastating for Polish agriculture because Polish farmers utilize much more energy compared to regular households. By 2030, according to the assessments, the ETS will account for additional 100 uh, billion zlotys that goes to the budget. According to this line of thinking that we need to undergo uh, energy, energy transformation, if we invest in Opole and similar investments, and if we build towers that we pay 2 billion Polish lotus and we destroy them uh, and pay even more, we'll be burning the money, saying you cannot do it, you cannot attain, attain uh, climate uh, neutrality. I'm myself a scientist, and the science is pretty clear about it. Before 2040, we need to be climate neutral if we want to avoid a climate disaster. This is our obligation of us, adults, and you, the decision makers. It is for us, for our grandchildren and our children. Nobody is going to take away this responsibility from us. MP, it goes to you. We, Isabella Zygmunt said it right. We need to think where we take our energy resources from, who we pay to, how it impacts international relations. And this departure from energy that is based, energy generation that is based on energy resources is a wise one. It's a wise activity of European Union on scale. You need to remember that this is not the problem of European Union and European Union member states, because we do the purchases from foreign countries. Not only do we speak about crude oil and natural gas, but also coal. coal. Being independent of non-renewable sources is very much to the interest of uh, energy security of our country, it is worth talking about. And when we talk about the fact that as the result of the package, some of the heavy duty industries pushed away uh, to other countries, it might be the result of the Green Deal, I might pose the question, should we invest into coal-fired energy? Should we subsidize this business sector? Isn't it better to invest in city project and similar ones that produced greater added value rather than Polish energy sector? This is something that we should see. It's not true that cheap energy fuels economic development and civilization development. If it was so, Venezuela would have been one of the best developed countries in the world, a similar Russia, but this is not the case. And if you're asking about the impact on Polish environment, is it sufficient? I had the pleasure of running two investigations among farmers over the last two months period. The first one at the Climate Coalition request, it was uh, done among orchard uh, owners in the Sandomierz region. This is the second most important orchard region in Poland, 500,000 uh, tons of uh, produce and farmers are afraid. They are truly afraid of the challenges that are posed by the new Green Deal and the uh, uh, field to fork strategy. This is the element of Fit for 55. Yet there's still the necessity to, to have these um, activities because what they can see among the greatest challenges that they have to face, they include counteraction uh, to the climate change. The greatest disasters that I have experienced over the last five years, what is ranked in the first five uh, in the ranking list are the ones associated with the climate change and instability of uh, farming production results in great challenges uh, for the agricultural business sector and the fact that uh, farmers and orchard uh, farmers give up on their production is the direct result of the climate change. We need to result that agriculture and food production accounts for 28, or even better to say 30 plus billion of surplus in foreign trade. And there is no better sector to generate this surplus. If some of the farmers give up on the production, will result in huge problems for Poland's economy, at least for the very sector. And one more thing on top of that. The second research that they carried out uh, was requested by some other entity, uh, 
this is a business secret. I cannot tell you which was the entity, but it was among the delegates of uh, agriculture chambers that were joining the General Assembly. And there was a completely different image of the situation because these activists that were associated with this assembly, they have much more negative perception over Fit for 55. Why am I saying that? Because this is the element to build a narrative on European Union politics that uh, may be negative for Polish agriculture, may have a negative impact. But once we switch from uh, uh, quantitative to qualitative uh, research and we started talking to these delegates, we had in-depth interviews in the number of 170 interviews within the scope of this research. Only then did we discover they said, yes, these changes that are pushed by the European Union are necessary because these are the market expectations, consumers' expectations, and these are the needs of uh, what we should do if we don't meet the challenge of climate adaptation, if we don't meet the challenge of uh, climate protection, we'll have to pack our bags and go from business. Minister, I believe that you have been called to answer to the questions. So having uh, had Mr. Petriccione speaking, having had Isabella Zygmunt speaking, the representative of the European Commission, they assure that a Fit for 55 package includes aid for um, thermal modernization of buildings, and it includes uh, safeguards against energy poverty, as you mentioned, uh, transport exclusion that you mentioned too. And at the end of the day, it is designed to make European Union member states' independence on the fossil fuels, not necessarily uh, from the countries that are not necessarily uh, positive for us, and escape uh, of emissions to other countries, which is counter-competitive. Uh, so all these, uh, what you have been assured of, uh, does it uh, come down? What is in the government? It goes to Mr. Czetwertyński. Uh, we need concrete uh, solutions rather than uh, promises. The question of addressing social problems that might be generated by the package was identified by the European Commission. We are very happy that the Commission sees the risks associated with this. They are aware of uh, potential risks and therefore they presented this kind of fund that is supported to support transformation, thermal modernization, and address the energy poverty questions. So I am posing myself a question. Is this really the best way to go, to create such a fund based on incomes, on this new ETS system, that is to include buildings and transport. Because if we create an additional tax that comes from uh, citizens in order to give the money back to the same citizens, this is too much of an endeavor, I would say. It's better to leave the money with the citizens so that they can use it in the first place rather than to take the money away and to redistribute the money back. I don't know whether the solution is the most effective one whether this mode of operation is most effective. I'm really happy that the problem has been noticed. I believe that we should have a tool that makes it possible to address energy poverty question, regardless the creation or expansion of the new ETS system. We see in Poland and outside Poland, in Poland, the energy prices are high, but not as high in, uh, as in other European Union countries. We have seen a huge problem, a huge social problem associated with energy prices in all EU member states. This problem has continued. It started well before Fit for 55 was implemented. So it does not matter whether I create a new ETS or not. This problem needs addressing. So we believe that the creation of the fund 
the creation of the instrument that makes it possible to address the problem of energy poverty should be independent of the question related to ETS expansion. So the question was planned for this round, not the question that was a response to what was happening here. Some of the United Right politicians say that Poland is not going to accept the Fit for 55 package or some of the conclusions of the uh, lawmaking notions that it is composed of. So what is the plan for that? What is the plan as of today? First and foremost, as you have rightly noticed, this is the package of legislative suggestions, proposals. It is not one document, but 14 documents that have been presented by the Commission. The value of each proposal differs, the importance of each of which, and the consequences, better to say, be it negative or positive, also differ. But when I look at the key proposals that we've been speaking about today, including ETS, I cannot uh, say fully responsibly that this is a comprehensive and painless system. It is not the case in Poland. It requires improvement. In the course of our discussion, we have indicated a number of questions that are associated with the system. What is clear for me is that in its today's form, it is not the proposal that could be supported by us. There is, uh, in the course of discussion, in the Council and the Parliament, there is the room for improvement to this Commission's proposal. And I believe this will be a case that will be able to improve this proposal so that we will have the system that makes it possible to support Poland's economy to transform and modernize Polish energy sector rather than staunch uh, this uh, transformation. So let me ask a question on top of what you said. Are there any concrete proposals to improve the package so that Poland is satisfied, Poland is ready to accept? Yes. In the course of discussions on specific proposals, in the Council and Polish MP, including Minister Tobiszowski, will be able to speak about the work in Parliament, but we work in close collaboration to improve the proposals. We need to convince our colleagues, other parliamentarians, other ministers in the Council, that it is worth introducing these solutions. I can indicate one area which is particularly important from the point of view of Poland. This is the question of CHP, the heating systems questions, through a plethora of proposals uh, of the Commission. Well, we are afraid that these uh, proposals may make it difficult to run a necessary modernization of the sector. Therefore, we try to improve on that by making it possible, for example, to continue support uh, from the government for these companies. Very often, these are communal companies that own big uh, heating system so that um, they can switch to zero emission sources. Um, but the proposal was made by the Commission, in fact, uh, make it possible for only until 2025. Looking at the situation in Poland, uh, the nature of the heating systems and the length of such investment procedures make it very clear that uh, such procedures will not be finished by 2025. So what does it mean? Municipalities that will not be able to make these investments by 2025 will be left with the current high emissions uh, uh, sources of heat. Uh, from my perspective, the perspective of my ministry competent for climate and air quality, it seems absurd. But 
these will be the consequences of the proposals made by the Commission. And this is just one example of many that I could uh, talk about to show how certain specific solutions proposed by the Commission can even stop or block the energy transition in Poland. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to first uh, ask you to address uh, the minister's uh, concerns. Um, the minister also said that it's not the wisest to take away first in order to give back, that we can do that uh, in a simpler way. How would you address that as well? Plus the question to you, uh, quite a new issue from this Friday, last Friday, the European Commission's high level advisory expert group decided that gas and energy from nuclear uh, shouldn't be labeled, labeled green in taxonomy. What does the European Commission plan to do now about it? Well, thank you. Let me start with a general point, which I think is coming through the, the conversation. I think we have to stop uh, speaking about costs without defining what we're talking about. Cost is something you pay and doesn't come back. If you put money into something and it comes back, that's an investment. Now, when we talk about cost of this transformation, nobody talks about the cost of refurbishing fossil fuel investments. Uh, half to two thirds of Polish coal-fired power station will need scrapping or uh, rebuilding completely over the next, uh, over the next uh, 10 years. Uh, that's money. And that's money goes to perpetuate the status quo, which is very costly for us. Poland imports less fossil fuels than others, but it does. We spend in Europe 270 billion euros every year in importing fossil fuels. And somebody has said, usually from countries who are not necessarily our best friends. Uh, that doesn't make sense. We are in the middle of a gas crisis. I've lived through the first oil crisis in the early 1970s. Every few years, we have a, a fossil fuel crisis. How long do we want to continue with this? Plus, the cost of adaptation is going up enormously. If we start putting all this in balance, what we see is that the money we're talking about here, it's big, it's huge, but it's an investment in a better future, in a more competitive economy, in a modern economy, in new technologies where we have a competitive advantage over others, in new jobs that will last longer than the jobs that we, that, that we have now. So there's a general point. Now the question is, how do we do it? Not everybody can do it. And there are inequalities between those who need to do the transformation and those who could pay for it. And redistribution is the name of the game. So to answer the specific question that, that, that you, you, you ask, how else do you do in a civilized government? Um, how do you find the resources? You tax and redistribute. That's what every government does. So at the end of the day, if we don't have a market mechanism like DTS that makes the biggest polluters pay, it's a citizen who will have to pay because you're not going to have a drastic change in refurbishing buildings in Poland without investing and without helping people to modern, to renovate. The money, there has to be a need for public money there. Either it comes from the government, which comes from having tax citizen. What we are proposing is a system where a minority of people own most of the buildings and would put the most of the money and redistribute that money to the majority of people who could need a, re a renovation and couldn't afford it. There is a redistribution element. Of course, there is a redistribution. What is government there for? Um, and uh, the alternative is that you tell people renovate. You tell people renovate, either they can afford it, in which case it works fine, or they can't afford it, in which case, what do they do? You send them to jail? Um, or you invest to help them and you get money from the taxpayer. So at the end of the day, we're not talking about um, something which is new and strange. We're talking about finding a more efficient way to redistribute from those who could afford to help and don't to those who would like to help and can't afford it. Now, we're not married to these proposals. 
the executive vice president Timmermans has been saying publicly more than once, if you have a better idea, please tell us. We, we've made the best proposal we thought we could. We don't think it's uh, the best thing ever, but we can't find anything better. If anybody finds anything better, but we need money to invest in this renovation. We need money to help the citizen who can't afford to do it themselves. And that money is going to come from somewhere. It's not going to come, it's not going to grow on trees. Adam is absolutely right. Energy poverty is there now. It would not be created by this new system. These resources can be used to address the problem which exists today, uh, and which we have neglected for too long. And yes, this is a minority of Europeans. Is 30, 40 million over 450 million. But they deserve help as much as anybody else. So at the end of the day, this kind of transformation also gives us a, um, an opportunity. Other proposals, heating systems, dates, and things, that is, that's why this is a legislative process. You know, this is not a dictate uh, of what must be done at all costs. Commission makes a proposal. The member states and the parliament as co-legislators debate and decide. And if they want to change it, they change it. And the commission will be ready to help uh, with those changes if there is consensus about that. Your last point on the taxonomy issue. Look, that's a very controversial issue. Gas and you know, nuclear is a zero uh, emission source. There are other environmental problems with nuclear energy. Uh, and uh, you have a very divided society in Europe between supporter and opponent of new or nuclear power. What we are saying in the, in the document we published is nuclear has zero emissions and contributes to eliminating emissions. Um, but if you want to have it environmentally friendly, you need to address the other problems, in particular, the big problem of the radioactive waste. Uh, without that, nuclear isn't a, a, a smart thing. And that I think is not, it's not, it's not new. I mean, everybody, opponents and uh, detractors have been saying this for decades. So, you know, this is not revolutionary. Gas is an excellent transition technology, um, especially for countries like Poland who are coming from coal. There are countries, my own for instance, who already have too much gas because they've done that transition before. Now they should stop using gas and moving more into renewables. Uh, so it is useful, it's important, but gas is still a fossil fuel. It cannot be used forever. So the real question is not gas or no gas. The question is, how much gas do we need in exchange for what? When do we stop using it? How do we make sure that in doing so, we're not wasting our money in investment which lasts longer than it should? That's a real conversation we need to have and not start putting labels left, right, and center. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Teraz uh, do pana ministra uh, Tobiszewskiego. Od razu zadam dwa Thank pytania. Thank you very much. I have two questions uh, to Mr. Tobiszewski and I would like to ask you to keep your answers short because I've seen that in the Q&A box we have a lot of questions and instead of asking my questions, I will uh, ask the questions that the audience is posing. So what should be the role of coal regions in the future energy system? And my second question um, has something to do uh, with the, uh, the study. It says uh, that uh, Poland and the Czech Republic will be responsible for 95% of uh, energy production from fossil fuels by 2030, and Poland will be the country that will be most reliant on um, fossil fuels and coal in the future. As the member of parliament, what do you think, uh, what uh, should be done? Right now, there are more countries that rely on fuel, so there are more opportunities for support. How should we use these opportunities in order to find resources to modernize our energy system? Uh, thank you very much. Of course, I will 
answer uh, your question about coal, but I don't want to be associated with coal only and be seen as a support of coal only, even though I have to admit that I do believe coal has a role to play. And uh, so in terms of importing coal from other countries, non-European countries, of course, I oppose it. And what Germany is doing and what Poland is doing is wrong. Um, Germany uh, buys three times as much uh, of lignite from non-EU countries than Poland. And if we were to look at the energy mix or in Germany, it's more than 50% coal. So it's not just Poland that is the culprit, not just Poland is the problem, but Poland is the country that's not spoken of. But let's look at the proportions. And let's try to be logical about it. On the one hand, we want to close Polish mines. We don't want to import coal from other countries. So which energy sources should we use in transitional, uh, in the transitional years if we don't have renewables on, um, we don't have enough investments in gas as transitional energy source. Where do we find energy then? Ladies and gentlemen, I don't think there is a dispute between us um, in terms of the need of protecting the climate, but we have to be logical and regional. That's if large countries such as India, China and Indonesia don't uh, act in parallel with European actions, we will lose the battle. We have to be convincing and we have to convince these countries to go hand in hand with us. Let's not demonize this 8% caring for the climate. There's this gentleman who wrote uh, that phasing out coal in Germany is questionable. Um, ladies and gentlemen, of course, we should set ambitious goals. We should care for the climate. But if there are places where that will suffer from blackouts and that will not have energy, it will be risky for the climate because it will not only lead to social problems, but also climate problems. Closing two roof today will be a more serious problem for climate than finding alternative solutions. When you close mines, these areas have to be recultivated and the laws of physics and mechanics apply to the economy as well. And it is the economy that makes our lives better. Let's not give up on modern technology and not, let's not fight whether or not we need renewables, because we do. Uh, but let's imagine and let's ask yourself that question, is it realistic for Poland to rely on the renewables only if we don't have wind, for example? Sweden last year bought fossil energy from Poland. Why? Because the windmills were froze. And we have to be realistic because our citizens will not forgive us if um, there will be blackouts. And I agree that this process is long. But ladies and gentlemen, uh, really, let's focus on logical arguments and different parties, different political parties held the power in Poland in different periods of time and they were not successful. Maybe the reason is that the problem is complicated. I'm sorry for speaking longer than planned, but it is such a great debate and I really make sure to say that we need to appreciate what we have achieved in Poland. I don't think we believe that we can achieve even more. We don't appreciate our possibilities in Poland. I'm very happy that we are in dialogue with Timmermans. And I agree, Timmermans says, yes, give me better proposals. And I'm very grateful to our ministry for working on better proposals because different countries have different conditionings. Spain is different. France in that invests in nuclear power. Germany that invests in gas, uh, replacing coal, and this process is happening, but it's not as fast as they expected. So what? Uh, so when we have renewables from wind, uh, from um, uh, solar, so what should be the transitional source? So it can be gas. If we are closing to all our uh, coal-powered plants, good, it will do it. We need to have this transition period. We cannot close them down from tomorrow on because this is not my problem, but this is the problem of Polish energy mix that is supposed to diversify. 
and start going towards uh, RES as broadly defined. Uh, nuclear energy, offshores uh, on the sea and onshore, because still we have some place. Economic development uh, requires more energy and it triggered European uh, crisis. There are investments with our gas and I agree that we cannot depend on resources from outside. But the question is how to do that through diversification, because otherwise we aren't able to do that. It is very important to think and discuss about the facts and figures and be precise. I don't share Isabella Zygmunt's uh, joy regarding Fit for 55 and this optimism. If there are no problems in documents, we don't have this kind of resistance in France, Germany, in Poland. But I need to tell you that I have documents from German representatives, even the Green Party representative who did not accept this introduction of uh, this uh, program. Michel Gross uh, does not accept it. Uh, I, don't, I have it marked. ETS-related uh, questions are not accepted. What is proposed by uh, Peter Lisa from APP? But I believe this is the case of very important documents because they need to be discussed. If it was a wonder and wonderful, uh, well prepared, miraculously prepared, we wouldn't have as many questions because Europe is associated with uh, countries that have different energy mixes and different economic history. And I need to think it over. We need to think it over. It's good we discussed Fit, Fit for 55 project, but I think that Fit for 55 needs to take uh, into condition in all the preconditions what minister mentioned polish heating uh, system what we have in this uh, project in this design is dramatic in 2026 we are going to have uh, lots of forest cut down to heat up also and i believe that we need to see it we need to perceive it we need to recalculate it i'm not saying that it all goes down the drain but let's face the realities because these people will not forgive us if there is no energy no heat care for climate is the foundation natural environment is the foundation but also civilizational growth economic growth and competitive on the international arena thank you very much thank you very much isa you've been called to, to give the answer Does Europe provide for different preparation and today's mixes in the member states? The heating questions that have been touched upon by Minister and Minister Czetwertyński too. Minister mentioned that Poland needs interim fuel, this transition fuel to switch for nuclear energy so that there is a guarantee for infrastructure energy safety and security before we go res total i can say as much as this i'll stick to this uh, information that we talked briefly according to treaties european union does not inform what is the energy mix but they do deal with what is the result uh, of environmental result, emission levels through an ETS system. So the other thing that needs highlighting, member states of the European Union are provided a general framework. We know what is the climate objective. We know what is associated with it when it comes to emission reductions, not only on the national level, but whole European Union level. Therefore, it is objective of member states to decide how they want to pave the way which leads to their contribution to meeting the general EU objective. So I think there is still room for Poland to do it in optimal and beneficial way for itself. So the question pertaining to energy mix means that the European Union does not impose anything, but we've got the emission goal and the European Union regulations will try to meet this emission reduction objective. So this is as much as I can say when we have this perception from the point of view of European Commission or European Union in general. Thank you very much. And the question goes to Professor. European Commission 
proposes uh, to create internal CO2 sequestration uh, program and support for coal-based agriculture. What does it mean in your opinion for climatic transformation? Thank you very much for this uh, question. Before I relate to this question, yes, please, but briefly, briefly. But yeah, you should, oh, you, you have a chance to refer to the previous ones. I'd like to thank director for indicating to the fact that we should speak about investment rather than cost related to transformation. What is missing in Poland are the studies that indicate the cost differences between specific sectors and uh, the whole uh, economy when we invest in zero emissions versus the coal structure if retained as it is today. Nobody wants to do that. Most probably we would have discovered that the costs are pretty similar, but the benefits associated with the transformation, if we do not transform, are greater. I do agree with MP Tobishovsky that we need a plan but I want to say that a climate coalition and uh, NGOs and experts have required the government and politicians to present a rational plan for six years now. A, a climate problem, strategy, protection climate in Poland. Uh, there is nothing of this kind in place. What they propose, giving up on coal by 2029, is not something that can be accepted. We need to have this initial assumption, climate is the most important indeed. We need to protect climate, and this is the framework for us to develop. And we need to fit in this framework, which means that by 2050, we need to be climate neutral. There is no other way out if we want to survive. I disagree with you, MP, that economic growth is the basis because the time of economic growth is now over. We need to uh, relate our development thinking on system stability, natural system stability related to climate system. And we can, as much as the ecological space makes it possible, and ecological space tells you by 2030, you need to limit emissions by 2040, 2050. In my opinion, what we need to do in Poland first and foremost is not to take up wrong and unwanted decisions. One of such wrong decisions was to exempt uh, VAT on uh, energy prices. This is a false signal sent to consumers. Energy will be cheap. That was a mistake made by the Polish government three years ago, because we do not push for energy transformation. Returning to your question, I think this is a very good direction. There is no problem with the energy sector. Energy sector will transform. We'll be squabbling and discussing it. There'll be bigger or smaller social problems, depending on the countries. But technologies uh, and knowledge and expertise is there in the energy sector. They can do it without any problems. Agriculture is a huge uh, problem. Transportation is a huge problem. And they will be facing difficulties related to greenhouse emissions. Most probably the first 50 or 60 percent uh, of emissions might be reduced. What remains? is the agriculture, emission-related agriculture, that is process-related emissions. In order to produce plants or animals, we need to emit greenhouse gases like NOxes, methane in animal production. So we need to use sequestration. We need to use the second largest carbon storage to increase sequestration, removal of uh, this from the atmosphere, binding it in the soil. It is a very important proposal that should be, in my opinion, complemented with protection and renaturalization of organic soil, because what lies there is the greatest potential to solve the carbon problem. 
in Pro Poland, it is also beneficial because it st stabilizes water management problems. This is a good direction. We should devise a way to support farmers who act this way, who provide ecosystem services related to climate protection. This is the right way to go for the common agricultural policies reform. Thank you very much, Professor. And as I was saying, now questions from the participants. And there is a plethora of questions. Minister, let me start with you. I will read the questions that I can see in the chat box. If you could briefly relate to these questions. So, ETS, how big resources for specific activities have been earmarked to provide energy, safety, and security in the country once coal-based sources of energy generations are removed. You said that ETS-generated quotas are not earmarked for investment, which is a problem, but still the money goes into the Polish budget, as Professor Karaczun said, and this is redistributed. So, Minister, can you tell us why, if the money should support transformation, it does not happen so. 25 billion Polish lotus of income in ETS, uh, it contributed to the budget. The government was supposed to earmark 50% of the sum for restructuring the energy sector, including RESs. According to our information, 1 billion was earmarked for COBISA. Where is the money used? Uh, I don't know whether I can read it properly. The Ministry of Climate, a new strategy for biodiversity. How are you going to comply with these uh, requirements where 30% of the European Union territory is to be covered with this program, including strict protection 10% level? When the government uh, limits the national parks like Świętokrzyskie, National Park. And the last question, not to make it too much, the critical part of legislation, transport-related ones in the European Union, especially emission standards of uh, passenger cars. Do we accept full departure from combustion engines starting 2035, or is there a chance to keep up biofuels in combustion engines? Wow. Thank you very much. Speaking about ETS income, how much of this is directed to Poland's economy? And what do we do with these resources? First and foremost, ETS system by principle, polluter pays. The company that emits CO2 needs to be held accountable and buy the emission rights in the market, emission permits in the market, so that to pay depending on the emissions. The thing is, not everything that Polish companies buy or have to buy goes to the Polish budget. This is related to the fact how the ETS system is devised. And these are the inequalities that result in the fact that the resources or the costs that are borne because of the ETS only partially goes to the Polish budget. So this is the first problem that we as the state have to cope with through the change of the system at the European Union level. Where does the problem come from? In the ETS system, emissions are calculated twice. So, industrial installations get some of the permits free of charge for their emissions. And in addition, in connection with the same rights or allowances, member stem, uh, states uh, receive 
revenue and they can sell it in auction. And this leads to a situation in which a country such as Poland, uh, from the net perspective, has to pay under the ETS system. And um, as for the rest, uh, it is fair to say that uh, the rest of the revenue from the auctions uh, does flow to the Polish budget. Maybe so far, these haven't been any huge amounts. However, in the last few years, the prices have been growing considerably. So the, the final amount has been growing as well. So how is this money spent right now? We have a number of support programs under the National Environmental Protection Program to support renovation of buildings, for example, or we spend it for the clean air program that's well known to everyone in Poland. Every year under this program, we spent more than 1 billion zloty. The Mój Prąd, so My Power program, is also another of these programs aimed at supporting uh, photovoltaics in households. And this program has been a gigantic success. Um, so we are talking with similar amounts uh, here. There are programs aimed at cutting emissions in public transport as well. Recently, the National Fund started uh, collecting proposals um, uh, for purchasing uh, zero emissions uh, means of public transport. So the goal is that in the major Polish cities, we would like to cut emissions uh, down to zero from public transport until 2030. So apart from all these programs that already exist, we have decided to allocate uh, a portion of these revenues for very specific goals, such as there is an already existing fund to support energy intensive industries, and it will be supported from these resources. And on top of that, we are working on a law that will create an energy transition fund aimed at supporting investment in modernization of the Polish energy. Um, and 45% of the revenue from the auctions will be spent under this program. So as regards the question about the biodiversity strategy, Uh, there has been recently a very interesting discussion on this subject in the European Union uh, around the question how we can reach our ambitious goals. When we compare the situation in Poland and in other EU member states, it turns out uh, that uh, the area, the protected area in Poland is much bigger than in other member states uh, and the rules that apply to our national parks are often much more ambitious or strict, uh, strict than it is the case in national parks of other member states, especially in uh, Western Europe. So to a very large extent, we could say that Poland is indeed contributed to reaching climate goals. Looking at different geographic areas uh, and regions, uh, when I analyzed uh, what the share of protected areas was, turned out that uh, we have already reached the 30% goal. Uh, of course, in the context of protected areas, it is important to remember that we need uh, the right tools to uh, protect uh, these areas and uh, these um, landscapes uh, such as meadows, because obviously you need other instruments and tools to protect meadows and other instruments uh, to effectively protect uh, forests, for instance. And some areas which are under protection can cope with a lower degree of support. 
from government on, or from employees of national parks and other need more. Um, I think we need to bring it to an end. And there was a question about emissions from combustion engines. So if you could respond to this question as well. Yes, right now we are talking about emission goals uh, for passenger cars. Uh, there is this discussion in the council right now. And the minister rightly said, if we want to reach our climate goals, we need to take ambitious steps in all sectors of the economy, not only energy, but also in uh, um, agriculture and others. And it will be essential that it happens in other uh, sectors of the economy as well. The requirements uh, that place a burden on car manufacturers uh, are obviously a better solution than creating a new ETS system that uh, will place a burden on the shoulders of consumers directly. So that's what I would like to say. Questions, uh, and again, I would like to ask you for really uh, short questions. So, uh, one, each country faces different uh, problems and conditions. How will the EU try to help uh, member states with their energy transition by adapting its methods to each one, or by setting some, some kind of a standard for all? That was one. One is from uh, uh, former Director uh, General uh, for Agriculture, Jerzy Pleva. Uh, after uh, the recent European Commission's uh, communication, we observed lively discussion on carbon farming with many voices in favor or, uh, or against. Is it tr uh, true that Polish farmers will be paid for what uh, they already did, as it was repeatedly said by, an important, by important EU politicians, or farmers will be remunerated in function in order uh, in function of additional carbon sequestrations in the soil of their farms. And final one, I would like to uh, ask you if it's possible for a member state to leave the ET ETS uh, system. Great. As usual, you put the bar very high. Um, first of all, first of all, let me react to the question of ETS revenues. And that goes also to your last question. The ETS is a European system, and for a reason. If every member state started having its own ETS or staying out of the ETS, you would have an impact on competitiveness within the single market. Occasionally, you might win. Most of the time, you lose, uh, because the market will react uh, to this uh, lack of competitiveness. And frankly, if we start damaging the internal market, uh, then what's the whole point of the uh, of the European economy? So it has to be a European system to be fair in the first place. Now, uh, that is one of the reasons why uh, a member state should not leave the ETS. The legislation does not foresee that possibility. Uh, it was never uh, a consideration. So member states uh, want to not to apply part of the EU legislation which has which it has contributed to writing and approving, then I think we have a real problem. Uh, now, on the revenues, sorry, uh, the ETS also overcompensates a number of member states. Uh, Poland receives more allowances to auction than it would be proportionally entitled to, up to 40% more than what it would be entitled to. Plus, we have a number of funds, like the Modernization Fund, which benefits 10 European member states, including Poland. And Poland has the biggest share of that. Uh, it's a 38 billion uh, euro fund. Poland has 43% of it. Access to it. Now, this is not money, it's not cash in hand. This has to come in the form of project for the modernization of the energy system. Those projects have to be verified by the European Investment Bank and have to be approved uh, by an investment committee made up mostly by member states. OK. But I mean, the money is there. So there is compensation for member states who can least afford the transition. Uh, and we, we have targets which apply to everybody. We have objectives that qualitatively apply to everybody. 
Now, the strategies to achieve those objectives is national. It doesn't get written in Brussels. It gets written in the national capitals. And that is exactly the problem we're talking about here. Which are the strategies of a number of member states? The point was made that uh, Germany has a lot more coal in its system than Poland. Of course, it's also a much bigger economy, but Germany has a plan to uh, exit coal and it's now revising that plan downwards. Uh, we know that Poland, Poland will get out of coal one day. The question is when, what replaces it, at what risk, and what can we do to help? That is the, uh, the real question we should be debating rather than talking about coal or, 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 or no coal. Um, as for uh, my old and very good friend, Jersey, very happy to see at least his name, if not his face. Um, and uh, that's premature, I'm afraid. What we are doing at the moment, we are, first of all, experimenting. See, how does carbon farming actually works? It can work, there are good examples. Can we generalize it? Can we create on that basis a European system? We're not there yet. And uh, Jersey knows how complicated that issue is uh, because of the job is that. Secondly, this year we've also proposed legislation on accounting and verification of uh, carbon removals, which is essential for carbon farming. If we can't count it properly, and if we don't know what it is uh, and how to calculate it, creating a European scheme would be completely open to fraud. Uh, this is a project, it's a medium term project. Um, and then I don't know what the answer would be to that particular question. Both options are on the table. But the important thing at the moment is that we study and spread the knowledge of how to make it work in practice, and we create a legal framework so that if people uh, claim carbon removals, everybody knows and agrees how much, for how long, uh, and what is worth it. Thank you very much. Uh, Ministra Tobiszowski, mam do panie, pana pytanie podwójne. I have a double question to Mr. Tobiszowski. How would you respond to the fact that under declarations of China and India, they will reach a climate neutrality one decade earlier than Poland? And how does this affect your competitiveness argument? And also the fact that China has a plan of fading out coal and Poland doesn't. So that's... Uh, Yes, we know that by the decision of the Polish Prime Minister, uh, we will face out coal by 2040 and we will reach climate neutrality. It is so obvious that I think someone who asked this question, uh, I don't think it is uh, okay. Uh, if God allows China or India will uh, abandon coal by 2060, why not? But I know it is realized that uh, 3 million 700 uh, billion 700 million, this is a scale of coal mining in China, in Poland, it is much, much less, it can't be compared. I would like to thank the professor for addressing a very interesting topic, soil and carbon footprint. I think it's a very important subject from the point of view of protecting the environment, but also from the point of view of uh, entrepreneurship in in agriculture if i may describe it like this so yes uh, carbon capture uh, there are technologies to do it in the us norwegians came to poland to, to a conference we organized when we talked about solutions for capturing co2 uh, carbon storage also very important and we should bear these technologies in mind because on the one hand obviously we need to cut emission as much as we can but we won't be able to cut them to a zero level because human beings and animals produce co2 we can't uh, cut it so caring about the climate bearing in mind the climate goal we have to remain rational and we have to join forces because one thing is very important and i agree that we can't use economy for everything this is not the point you cannot demonize economy but this is not the way i go if there are no um, activities such as environmental protection if this is not socially accepted and supported we're going to lose the battle because we need to 
persuade European citizens, all European citizens, all Europeans, those who were born and who came to Europe, so that they see the benefits, that it makes sense. It is for citizens. This is not idea fix. In CE, we know especially that idealization of economy boils to a very bad result. We need to be able to explain to citizens, show the results, and still we want new technologies and care for the climate uh, is a part of uh, competitiveness of the economy because Europe cannot fall behind. Thank you very much for your invitation and those who have been taking part in the discussion. I'd like to thank for all the topics uh, that we called up. Uh, greetings to all of you. May we have a chance to discuss, to discuss it again because it is very important for Europe, for Poland. And we Poles, we have something very advantageous and crucial to say. What the director was speaking about, Germans have the plans associated with scraping coal, I would say conventional energy based on carbon. Because two years ago, as we remember, in Germany, they restarted the mines. A mine is not bad on its own. If there is no need to have coal, we are not going to mine for coal because there will be no demand for that. I do agree with that. In Poland, there is the need to have uh, energy doctrine, energy doctrine, a vision that brings together all political parties so that in a further, longer perspective, we can work for the benefit of Poland and Europe. And I agree with your director here that this is very important. But what is also very important is that if, if Poland puts energy products, and uh, projects, I remember this from the Ministry I used to work in, but in the stems of office, uh, the provision, the climate provisions have changed, which resulted in the fact that we need to recreate energy mix in Poland, aligning to the conditions not from Poland's internal transformation questions, but from what is perceived by the Commission, including Timmermans. Thank you very much, and hello to everybody. Thank you very much, Minister. So one question to Isa and Professor Karachun, and Minister Czetwertyński, and Director, if you want to say a goodbye sentence, it will be a chance for you. ESA, ETS, imposed on aviation or car transport will support public transport. Railway transport, will it support these two? The European Union emission trading system provisions is that, and it includes the reform of it. We have the obligation to spend 50% of the resources for transformation. In the new proposal of the Commission, they say it is going to be 100%. So speaking about earmarking the resources for specific goals, there is no precise wording, because still it is a member state's decision what to spend the money on, as long as the money is earmarked for energy transformation support. When speaking about this new ETS money that is supposed to be created for road transport and buildings, I think it will be the same principle, at least in the uh, Commission's proposals, this is what we can see. But uh, this proposition, this proposal, such as also the creation of uh, social uh, climate funds. So 25% of this income is transferred to a special fund uh, to exercise protective measures, the redistribution that the director was speaking about. So this is the support for the people who are most disadvantaged when it comes to the result, when it comes to the cost of use of the buildings and what is happening in transport sector. So these activities, the supportive activities can be supported and also activities that uh, can be described as income support, contributions for those in greatest need in order for them to uh, provide for energy or transport needs. But the question is, will the money go to develop uh, railway transport? Yes, if it is the decision of the member state. Uh, if it goes to this member state's budget. And Professor, 
CCS system, sequestration doesn't work anywhere outside the laboratory. CCS on an industrial scale does not work anywhere, but we need to think about sequestration, carbon binding in different technologies, because all scientific models show that if we reduce emissions, we attain neutrality goals, we want to provide this goal, we'll have to remove CO2 and greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. So the sequestration is on the horizon, but emissions reduction is the basis. If we think about Fit for 55, it hasn't been said clearly today. Uh, I'm sorry about not saying this. This is the program when you think about economy, civilizational development, economic development in the light of the, the climate crisis, it requires for us to develop a new model of economy, new model of thinking. Because Fit for 55 is an element for this, it is the first step towards this direction. And I think that if this kind of debate contributes towards our different line of thinking on the development. What is a political challenge? What is economic challenge? It is good to have this kind of debates. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Professor. Minister, very last remark, reference to the four speakers, a concise wrap up, a home take message for us. I'd like to thank for this discussion because uh, it had very interesting themes included in it. From my perspective, it's obvious that we, as the country, need to undergo transformation and modernize the energy sector, regardless the energy policy that was designed by the uh, Commission. This is the energy system as it is today. The uh, power supply units uh, have a certain age and fuels that Professor Karachin was speaking about in his earlier intervention. There are many re reasons for us to undergo transformation. And I hope that we are able to develop solutions in the council and the parliament that will truly support transformation rather than staunch the transformation. And I hope that we are able to develop solutions in a conceptual way by developing unity of Europe rather than giving additional reasons to increase the number of those who oppose this process. Thank you very much. Director Patriciana, uh, how would you like to conclude today? We don't hear you. Yes, sorry. Uh, I think this conversation, for which I'm very grateful, uh, shows once again that we don't have a divergence of view of what needs to be done. We have sometimes a divergence view of how fast and how far it is uh, safe to go. Uh, we hope we can persuade our Polish friends that not going fast is not safe in a world that's changing under our feet. And that we can find rational ways to travel together uh, towards our common objective. And we're there to help. We're there to help, we're there to discuss with Poland, we're there to help. And uh, I'm convinced that uh, we'll get there. Thank you. Thank you very much. So then, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. This very interesting and constructive discussion is therefore concluded. And we have had uh, Adam Zibor Czerwczyński, Director Rafael Mauro Petricione, MP Grzegorz Tobiszowski, Izabela Zygmunt and Professor Zbigniew Karaczon. May you have a very good evening and hope to see you soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.